There are a lot of mechanics to consider in Hogwarts Legacy and while you're introduced to them gradually, there are still a ton of things the game doesn't teach you while they are handy to know. Like what to pay attention to when picking your wand, how to best manage all of your spells, some tricks to make many of the puzzles a lot easier and way more. So if you're excited to play Hogwarts Legacy and enjoy the content here on the channel, then totally leave a like, subscribe because we got way more spoiler free tips and tricks videos on the game coming your way and let's go. So the the first two major decisions you need to make in the game are your Hogwarts house and your personal wand. Both these things happen very early in the story and while I think most people should already have an idea which house they want to play, choosing your wand can be a bit tougher. There are a lot of things that don't really have an impact like the wand length and the pliability but what is of course important is the look of your wand. There are a couple of different appearances to choose from but once you settle for yours you cannot change it again on that character. which does of course makes sense considering each witch or wizard has a sort of connection with their wand but what I didn't know is that it's actually only the top half of your wand that matters. Because from various sources you can find these wand handles that change how the grip of your wand looks. There are a lot of different styles to collect and as you can see my spiral shaped wand looks a lot different from when I first got it because of the avian handle I've equipped. Which you get from completing a simple side quest you can already do very early on. You need to talk to a student named Cressida for a quest called Flying of the Shelves. She's in the central hall so talk to her then grab some flying books from the library close by and return them to her to receive this reward. And there are tons more wand handles you can find through quest or special chests. So when picking your wand at Ollivander's the main thing you want to pay attention to when you are customizing it is the top half of the wand as that cannot be changed later. And this wand will of course serve you well in both puzzle solving and in combat. Jordan already mentioned this in his his review which I will link to in the video description but while the combat feels great juggling between your spells and your spell diamonds can be a bit of a hassle which is also true from my experience of course not at the beginning when you only have one spell diamond but as soon as you unlock the talent system through the main story you can unlock up to four of these which I totally recommend doing as soon as possible but it can still be a little hard to manage at first especially while you're also still getting used to all the spells in your arsenal but the one thing that really helps me out in combat is making sure I bind the same color of spell to the same button in each spell diamond. As you might know, enemies in combat will have different colored shields, which indicate the type of spell needed to break them. There's yellow for control, red for offensive, and purple for four spells, and you'll want to break these shields as soon as possible with the correct spell, otherwise you won't be able to attack that enemy. So to make that as easy as possible, I have my spell diamond set up so that triangle is always a control spell, square is always an offensive spell, and X is always a four spell. That way, I can swap between these diamonds as much as I'd like for different spells but when I need to break a specific enemy shield I only have to think about which button to press because the spell type is the same in all spell diamonds. Of course you can use another configuration that works for you and we will share some cool spell combos in a future video too but putting some forward planning into your spell button layout can really help you out. Another thing I found useful in combat but that the game doesn't tell you has to do with the stupefy spell. This can only be cast after countering an attack first which you do by pressing triangle on PlayStation or Y on Xbox when this yellow halo appears above your head. If you hold instead of press the button, you will deflect the initial attack and then counter with stupefy, stunning an enemy, which means your next hits on that target will also deal more damage. But what I quickly found out is that if you use your lock on, you can cast stupefy at the enemy you're currently attacking, even if you parry another enemy's attack. So if you're focusing on a single target and then get attacked by someone else, you can can counter their attack, hold triangle and then cast stupefy on your main target to stun them and deal increased damage. If you'd rather stay inside the walls of Hogwarts while getting your bearings, it's smart to accept every quest you come across. A lot of these, especially in the castle it seems, resolve around you collecting an object or a set of objects which will only appear once the quest is active in your log. So while these Dedalian keys do not show up at first, if you accept the quest from a student in the transfiguration courtyard over here on the map, 
trap next to the fast travel point with the same name, you are able to find them flying around the school. The same is true for Cressida's flying books in the library that we just mentioned, Zenobia's gulpstones that she wants you to find. So in short, really smart to accept as many quests as possible, even if you don't plan on completing them right away, so you can come across all these different items naturally while exploring the rest of the castle. And while completing quests will often reward you with new appearances for your collection or money, the best rewards come from these big legendary chests. These seem to reward a guaranteed legendary gear item, which are sometimes unidentified after unlocking the room of requirement. And these unidentified items always drop on the level you get them on, so don't wait too long before you identify them, because then they will become underleveled. But definitely keep an eye out for these special chests that reward you with some of the best loot in the game, and you'll also want to save before opening them. Because the loot reward is random each time, so if you're looking for a specific type of item, like gloves or headgear, you can just reload your save, open the chest again, and then do this as many times as needed until you get an item you want. And while those chests might be a bit rare, there is one very common resource that you shouldn't ignore, field guide pages. While these might seem uninteresting if you're not interested in the lore, keep in mind that the only way to earn experience is by completing challenges in your wizard field guide. So if you want to level up, you have to do things that contribute to a challenge. This also means that if you have completed a challenge, let's say the one for killing dark wizards, that you won't earn XP from fighting these enemies anymore. And the same is true for these field guide pages, but completing these challenges will take you a bit longer, and with each page giving you 80 experience each, it's a very nice way to level up. The reason we're pointing these out specifically is because they are very easy to get and there are a lot of them. In the open world they're even marked on the map so then it's just as simple as reaching a location and casting Revelio close to the glowing scroll outline to make the field guide page appear. As a general rule of thumb you find these in front of special points of interest. So make sure you use Revelio often but in Hogwarts and Hogsmeade there are also papers that require other spells to grab them. Again the process is really simple here if you have the right spell, so it's practically free experience. You've probably already come across these flying ones, which are grabbed by quickly casting Accio on them, but Levioso, another one of your first spells, can also be used on these specific statues to make a field guide page appear. You can easily identify these by the orb in their hand or the feather mark at the statue's feet, or you can of course simply cast Revelio to see if the object turns blue, meaning it's interactable. Which will also show you these braziers that can be lit for a field guide page by casting Incendio, or if you're a little bit further in the game, you can also use Confringo to light braziers that are a bit further away. Another type of puzzle you come across pretty often in the school are these magic dice puzzles. They consist of a math equation with a question mark, which you need to answer by flipping the dice in the wall to the correct symbol. Problem is, when you first see them, none of these symbols make any sense. And while I imagine that you could figure out what each one means by comparing all the different equations throughout the school, you can also use the trick most people use to get through high school and grab yourself a cheat sheet. It's located very close to the divination classroom flu flame, so instead of going up the staircase to the classroom, we go through the door on the right of the flu flame and then go right on these wooden walkways, where you will find one of the puzzles, but more importantly, in the chest next to it is a cheat sheet that has all images with all corresponding numbers next to it. And you can see now that there is actually a logic to the system, with a unicorn that has one horn representing the one, and a spider with eight legs counting as eight. But with this cheat sheet in hand, you should easily be able to solve any of these puzzles you come across. And the rewards are pretty good too, as the ones we've opened always contained at least one chest with a gear item and one chest with a random decoration for the room of requirement. And there will be even more of the castle to explore after unlocking the Alahomora spell, which you get from the main story, and that allows you to open up different locks to get access to new rooms. The mini game associated with this spell is actually really easy, although the game doesn't do a great job of explaining it. You simply move the outer wheel with the green spark, which you control with your left stick, and do this until the green wheels in the bottom right corner move as well. Now hold it there and start moving the red wheel with your right stick. Pay attention to the inner wheels now, and when they start turning and the green wheels are still moving as well, you have to hold them in place for a bit and then the lock will open up. It's also important to check if you've received any mail from time to time. While the game does bring your attention to outpost, as you will see an exclamation mark in your menu if you've got a new letter from someone, it does not tell you that opening these letters can sometimes be required to start a quest. At one point during his playthrough, Jordan was unable to proceed with the main quest, but after opening a letter, the next quest appeared in his menu and he was able to
to continue. So next to your quest log, you should always check your outpost from time to time to make sure there are no important quests waiting for you. Let us know if you found any other useful tips while playing Hogwarts Legacy and of course subscribe to the channel as we got way more spoiler free tips and tricks coming your way as well. Leave a like if you enjoyed the video and if you want you can watch Jordan's review of the game by clicking on the screen. I will see you in the next one, goodbye.